Father, I just truly do thank you for being here this morning, for ministering to your people. I have chosen this generation to carry my mantles of miracles throughout this land. But children, why will you not lay aside that sin that so easily besets you? I cannot use you in this state. I need holy, righteous people. I need those who will stand and then stand and then stand against the wiles of the evil one. Why is it that you vacillate back and forth? Why is it that you cannot live a holy life? I have given you all that I have to give, and I have nothing else to give. I have equipped you to walk righteous and holy. I have called you forth in this day and in this hour, this dispensation of time to save those lost souls. Are you not part of the harvest? Can I still not count on you? to go forth and bring in the lost and the dying. My heart is heavy this day. My heart is so heavy for Delaware. Delaware needs to repent and come back to their first love. It needs to repent and let my light shine throughout this state. I am calling forth those who I have anointed and appointed for this day and this hour to come out of hiding and to come forth and allow me to use you in all my might and all my power. You are supposed to be the first state and not the last. You are supposed to be the head and not the tail. Instead of minister, ministers staying in Delaware, they are moving to other states. When I had called them to stay here and allow me to use them to free up Delaware and to bring my glory in all of its fullness. I am on a statewide search right now, looking for those in Delaware who will say, yes, Lord, and truly mean it, then follow me with all of their hearts. Father God, I thank you for your word of instruction. I thank you, Father God, that your grace is so sufficient. And Father God, for everyone who heard this word this day, I just cover this word with the blood of Jesus, that the enemy cannot steal it away. Delaware must come forth, Father God, and we know that. That's all I've heard for 50 years is that Delaware's a first state, but it's still the last. And so, Father God, I just thank you that you're still working on us and you're still doing a mighty works. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, God told me before I even was behind a pulpit that he didn't want me to move out of Delaware because he wanted to use me to help set Delaware free. I could have been many places and had much more than I have today, but this is where God has placed me. I wish that everybody would understand where God places them, and then they would stay there. But we have wandering feet. We're always chasing, I'm just hearing God say, we're always chasing the rainbow. We hear about revivals, what do we do? We jump in our car and we run to that revival, no matter where it's at. When in fact we should be staying here praying, God, bring revival into Delaware. 
This is a word that God gave me for the church this morning, and I titled it Falling Away. All right, Song of Solomon 2.15 is talking about Christ's care of the church. It says, the little foxes are ruining the vineyards. Catch them, for the grapes are all in blossom. The expression, little foxes spoil the vine, has found its way into our everyday lives, highlighting the importance of paying attention to and addressing the seemingly insignificant issues that could have long-term consequences. So Solomon 2.15 says, the little foxes are ruining the vineyards. Catch them, for the grapes are all in blossom. In other words, the harvest is ready. All right, this is what God said. Daughter, my people are still falling along the wayside because they are refusing to give up the little foxes that spoil the vine. You will weep and beg, but they have decided their own destiny. My Holy Spirit did all I could do, and then it stepped aside and allowed them the freedom to walk down the path of their own choosing. God is not going to jump in front of you and say, don't go this way. He's already told you, don't go this way. And if you choose to go that way, then God's going to let you go that way. And then don't blame him when you end up in the in the hole that Satan has already dug for you. Daughter, not one second goes by that another soul had, has walked away from the kingdom of light into the darkness. Every second, God is saying, somebody leaves him and goes into the darkness. This never needed to occur. I taught them the way to go. I continually showed grace and mercy. My love was always there. They chose the path they are walking on, and it is a path of total destruction. God said, I can walk you to the river, but I cannot force you to cross over into the promised land. God said, Moses led my children into the wilderness, and all they did was murmur and complain. I answered every desire of their heart, but they still wanted the leeks and the garlics. I freed them from Let's read Numbers eleven four through 6. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all because this manna before our eyes. God had given them freedom. They were prisoners. And he was bringing them out of bondage and into freedom to the promised land. But they wanted to go back and be in bondage again. They wanted to be slaves again. And God was taking them to a place where they would not be slaves. This is what's happened in the body of Christ. God frees you from your bondage, but you turn around and go right back into it. I don't understand that. Probably never will. God goes on to say, the same is going on this very day. And the people have tied my hands. I opened the prison doors just as I did for Peter. But they refused to walk out of their prison cells. The gnashing of teeth is beginning already. For there are those that know they will not get in the river. And now it is too late. You know, God took me to hell. I've told you people, you don't want to go to hell. It's forever torment, forever and ever and ever and ever. There's constant torment. There's screaming and gnashing of teeth in hell. And, and the fire doesn't go out. Your soul was t- constantly tormented. So why I was there three times. Why would you want to go there? Why would you want to do that? Daughter, there is absolutely nothing you can do. My Holy Spirit wooing was there all the time, and my grace and mercy bounded on all sides, but they refused my extended hand of love, and therefore they chose their own path. God has said, God said it takes strong people to endure the task set before their feet. And, you know, God said it takes strong people, and he told us that he, we were warriors, but what... What happened? 
Why did you why did you drop your shield and buckler? Why did you drop your sword? What ha- what what did Satan bring to you your eyes to entice you to leave the glory of God and go back into sin? This is what I said, although every individual has the opportunity to go to heaven after they die, not everyone will spend eternity there. According to the Bible, heaven is a place where people who have put their trust in Jesus Christ will spend eternity with him. And God said the broken and wounded are coming in fast and furious you know, into the house of God. But they will not have the power to set them free because of their being as Lot's wife, always looking back, desiring what they left behind. In Genesis 19, 26, but his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. You can go back and read that story. It's in Genesis 19. God said, my word tells you that all will not enter into the kingdom of heaven and all will not be able to walk the narrow path. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, heaven can be entered only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide enough for all the multitudes who choose its easy way. Verse 14 says, But the gateway to life is small, and the road is narrow, and only a few ever find it. You know, when I was first born again, I went to this church, and I became the praise and worship leader. And I would stand up there, you know, leading praise and worship. I'd look out, and I'd see sin in the pulpit. I mean, sin in, in, in the seats. And one day I just got so furious, I just stepped down off the pulpit, went and sat down and the teacher, the pastor me, what are you doing, Pastor Barbara? Get back up there and lead praise and worship. I said, no, I'm not going to stand up there and watch these people make a mockery of God. They're sitting right here in the house of God sinning. And I, you know, as I, as I got to know the people you know, before that, they were sinners at home too. But they came into the house of God singing the praises with a dirty heart. I couldn't deal with that. And I wasn't going to stand up there and, and pretend like it was okay. I haven't led praise and worship since. Because as I sit here and preach, I see people sinning in their seats. And I know they're sinning in their, in their natural life, you know, outside of the church. I get upset over that. My Jesus took a beating, suffered tremendously, hung on that cross, and they mocked him. And you're sitting in the house of God making a mockery of Jesus Christ. Your sin just, you'd rather go out there and sin than you would sit in the house of God. What, what has overtaken you? You know, I sit here doing praise and worship, saying, God, you know, do you want me to get up and walk around? He said, no, sit still. He said, I'm not bringing, I'm not touching nobody today. I even forgot what this was all about because he gave it to me quite a few days ago. Don't, don't you understand? If you look around you, other people's here is the church. God is dealing with your hearts. What is the problem? How are we going to say, you know, we had Wednesday night service was powerful. And then we come to this. What happened between Wednesday night and t- and last night? What kind of sins were you indulging in? You know, and cussing. I am so tired of hearing a child of God cuss and use that F word. That That is so disgusting to me. I hear it in my own home all the time. And I say, don't ever use that word again. But they're, they have the devil and they use it anyhow. That's the devil's language. It's not God's language. I've been praying God just glue their tongue to the roof of their mouth so they can't speak at all. I am sick and tired of people in my own home. Be little in my Jesus. Do you ever stop and listen to yourself? Sometimes record yourself and just see how many times you say that word and how disgusting it sounds. I don't care if it is in a dictionary. It's not in God's dictionary. Sorry, got the side right there. Let's go to Mark seven fourteen. Then Jesus called to the crowd to come in here. All of you listen, he said, and try to understand. 
your souls aren't harmed by what you eat, but what you think and say. Then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowds, and his disciples asked him what he meant by the statement he had just made. Jesus said, don't you understand either? The church doesn't even understand, so how are you going to tell the world? Don't you understand either, he asked. Can't you see that what you eat won't harm your soul? They were talking about food before that. For food doesn't come in contact with your heart, but only passes through the digestive system. By saying this, he showed them that every kind of food is kosher. You could eat anything you wanted. And then he added, it is a thought life that pollutes. What you allowed to be up here in this stupid mind? I want a drug, I want a drug, I want a drug, I want a drink, I want a drink. I want to watch pornography. You let it just re, you know, go round and round and round and round. And God told us that we need to take control of our mind. He said, I want to give you a new mind. I want to give you the mind of Christ. Why won't you let him do that? Ask yourself that question. Verse 21, well, R20 says, and then Jesus added, it is a thought life that pollutes. From who, for from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts of lust, theft, murder, adultery. Wanting what belongs to others, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, pride, and all other folly. All these vile things come from within. They are what pollute you and make you unfit for God. See that? It's your thought life, your stupid thought life. You need it whenever, whenever an evil thought comes in. You've got, you've got to replace that with the word of God. You have to just start singing, you know, praises of God. Do something and quit allowing your mind to take you back into that pigsty that God either brought you out of or is trying to bring you out of. God said it takes special dedicated people to walk the path Paul and Silas walked. You know, Paul, he was a very, very rich, well-known well -known man. And he was persecuting the Christians, right? And then God stopped him in his journey, took everything from Paul. He was no longer rich and important and everything else. And said, now, Paul, I want you to go forth to the Gentiles and bring them to Christ. Paul didn't bulk at what God was saying. He followed what he said, and he was persecuted the rest of his life. Put in prison, beaten, read about Paul. I really always thought Paul was one of the original 12. <laughs> so I found out, no, he wasn't. He committed, he committed afterwards. All right, it takes a special people. To, God said it takes a special people to walk as Peter and the other disciples walked. They all knew they would be, die a terrible death if they continued to follow my path, but follow the path they did. Everybody that call, God called into the ministry, they knew they were going to die. They knew they were going to be persecuted, but they followed God anyway. Many that counted the cost have already made it through, but others could not stand the cost, and they are falling. And they are God's talking about right now, this dispensation of time of people who have been called. Some have paid, the, they're paying the price, but others are not. When God first called me, right away after I was born again, God gave, said to me, Daughter, many are born to suffer, and you are one of those. You will suffer for my name's sake. Your walk will not be one without suffering. I did not say, I'm not going to do this, Lord. I didn't know what I was walking into, but I said, God, I will follow you no matter what. Because he had kept me all the days of my life. To, and it was 50 when I was born again. And I sure wasn't going to give in to the devil at that time frame. Are you listening? How much do you really love Jesus? How much do you really understand what, he, what kind of a price he paid for you? And how many of you really, truly do love him? And want to follow him? Not only, it's not that you want to, that you do follow him with all of your heart. You're never going to have peace until you give your heart totally to God. All right, so then I go back there. Many God said, many that counted the cost have already made it through. 
but, but others could not stand the cost and they are falling. He, you're falling right now. You're falling away. God said, I am sending the street people to you and you will minister salvation to those that are lost. Now, whenever the young man came up here and gave his heart to God Wednesday night, God said, that's their, your first street person and many will follow. So if we couldn't endure this young man that was up here Wednesday night, we're, God's not going to send us anybody else. God said, I am sending the street people to you, and you will minister salvation to those that are lost. The days of great harvest have begun, and it is not going to stop because this is a fullness of time. That's why your bulletin front says what it says, because for God gave him this, he said, we're walking in the fullness of time. This is a time God has allotted for this, the great harvest to begin. You know, we have a great movement of God, and then, then we have today. Then we might have a movement of God tonight, and God only knows what's going to happen Wednesday, because only God knows what he's going to do. And if you understand, is it, it fluctuates around what you people are doing between one service and the other, believe that or not. God wants to bless continually. He wants to fill the house up with unsaved so we can minister to them. But he cannot at, yet at this point. God said, your lights will go out. All, no, this is what's going to happen if we get, her, get everybody gets their act together. Your lights will go out all across this land and they will break up the darkness. Souls will be saved and join the ranks of the warriors. You're supposed to be a warrior. A warrior doesn't quit in the middle of the battle. But you guys have. You quit at the beginning. You quit a quarter way and you quit halfway in. You know, you, you just keep going back and forth and back and forth. You can't do that. You have to give your heart to God and then stay there and then seek God's face and to have yourself cleaned up. You know, you can talk a good talk, but you can't deceive the Holy Spirit. And anybody who's walking in the Spirit will know what you're doing. You hear me? You can you can act any way you want to around me. You can you can say anything you want to around me. But even as you're speaking to me, God said, they're not telling the truth. I've been told about a couple people that's on my staff. They only tell you half truth. They only tell you what they know that you want to hear just to keep on the good side of you. That doesn't make me feel good. In fact, that upsets me that you're, you know, pretending to be all for me and you're not. This is what we do to God too. You know, we only go halfway in. We don't go the whole way in. And because we don't go the whole way in, then we aren't, we really don't impact the world. Okay, God said, they will, these people he's going to bring in, they will come forth fully clothed in battle gear, never to take off their swords. This church has taken off your sword so many times. The swords, whatever it hangs on is worn out, the buckle to it. Amen. The time for greater works is upon you, and you shall see miracles you have never heard of before. This is in, this stuff right here is encouraging. God is telling us that great and powerful things. Are, it doesn't matter if you stay or not. God told me nobody else is going to stop your ministry. So whether you stay or not doesn't matter to me in that sense, but it does matter to me that you're losing your soul and you'll end up in hell. You see, those who don't know God and have been told about God, I know a few people have died and they really were never really taught the truth about Jesus. And they're in heaven when everybody else thought they were going to go to hell. Now, now they will be taught about Jesus. But guys, you guys know too much. You're judged on what you know. And I'm sorry, you can't quit now. Can't walk out there and you know and say, "Well, no, I don't want to be judged more." You're already judged because you know too much. I did not know this is what I was going to have to do up here this morning. John fourteen twelve, and Jesus said, "In solemn truth, I tell you, anyone believing in me shall do the same miracles I have done, and even greater ones, because I am going to be with the Father." 
You can ask him for anything using my name, and I will do it, for this will bring praise to the Father because of what I, the Son, will do for you. Yes, ask anything using my name, and I will do it. I'm going to I'm going to bring something up here. You you know I've been battling a battling a sickness, battling a sickness. I am being healed little by little because of what I'm taking to the Father. And he did something to me yesterday and so I know what it was, but that that part's healed. I have to fight my own battle to get my body healed. You all can pray for me, but you don't know what's going on in my body. And as these things come forth, I pray and I bind and I rebuke. And God, remember, I've told you I've died three times since I had COVID. And God said, daughter, you raised the dead and then you've been raising yourself from the dead. You know, you, you have power and authority. And if the devil's trying to kill you, don't let him kill you. And, you know, and I've been battling I've actually seen myself out of my body standing behind me and my body's dead laying in the bed. But I say, no, in the name of Jesus, I'm coming back into that body. Uh, you will not kill me. God said, you can't kill me. I'm fighting for my life. Are you understanding this? I'm not relying on you all to fight, for, fight this for me. I'm glad you're praying for me. I need your prayers. But we also have to do our own battles. Because we are the only one that truly knows what's going on in our mind. We're the only ones that knows what's going on in our body. We're the only ones that really know what's going on in our emotions. And if you're not going to fight, you're going to die. See, the body of Christ has been sitting around all these years wanting somebody else to pray for them. Pray them through. Do whatever. Pray, pray. And we do pray. We do cover you. But you need to start fighting your own battles. I call on the angels all the time for myself. I mean, I pray for other people and call, but I pray on it for myself. If not, I could be dead or maybe in a loony tune. You know, I could be anywhere. But God said, the daughter, you raised the dead, now raise yourself. So see, whatever, what, you know, so God put me through all that, allowed me to raise the dead and everything. Now I'm using it on myself. So whatever God lets you go through, and if you won the battle, now you can use it on your own self. Are you listening? What kind of testimony do you have? Well, I quit smoking for two months. Big whoop. Are you going to go back to it? You know? I quit drugs. Sort of. You know, you don't have a testimony. You quit drugs, period. You quit smoking, period. Why are you counting the days and the months that you didn't do it? Is there something in you that knows you're going to do it again? I, these are just things I'm throwing out there at you that you need to start thinking about. If you're free, you're free. You know, if you're healed, you're healed. I stand on the thing that Jesus told me, I have you already healed in the heavenly realm and I'm going to bring down to the natural and I'm going to return your youth. That's what I hold on to all the time. My healing hasn't manifested, but I'm not saying it's not going to manifest because it is. And I'm not saying, well, I've, I've been healed now. You know, if you're healed, you're healed, period. Come on. And, you know, like I was healed of the cancer, of, you know, of, uh, in my intestines when I first got born again. And the next morning, Satan put it back on me again. Maybe I had to crawl to the bathroom. But the whole way I said, I'm healed. I was healed last night at 8 o'clock when they laid hands on me. I'm still healed today. And I had to say that from the time I rolled on the, out of the bed onto the floor to I crawled into the bathroom, pulled myself up by the sink. And I said, I'm healed in Jesus' name, lad. And it, it was gone. See, I could have said, oh, well, I thought I was healed last night. And some of you in here right now, you 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 testified I got a healing, but you didn't hang on to it. When the pain come, you gave in to the pain. You see what I'm saying? You guys have got to think about this stuff. You 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 destroy your own self with the words you're speaking over yourself. Well, I don't even know where I'm at. 
All right, Jesus said, the anointing will be strong upon my people. This is the people he's bringing into the church. And they will go forth believing for miracles. And because of their great faith, the miraculous will occur. See, these street people are going to come in. God's going to touch them. They're going to have such great faith. For, they're going to believe what God did to them. They're going to go out there and win other souls where the church hasn't been able to win anything. Because you're not a good witness. You don't have a good testimony. Well, God sort of healed me. <laughs> we think we have to lie. You you know, but we don't have to lie. We stand on the words that God spoke to us. Okay, where am I at here? And because of their great faith, the miraculous will occur. The anointing has begun and it will not stop. Do you want the anointing that sets people free? Then walk in my holiness and righteousness. Do you want to be like Peter? Even his shadow healed the people as he walked by. People took Peter's handkerchiefs and laid them on people, and they were healed. You know, that works. Your anointing in you, you know, God's anointing to you can be so strong that you can walk by people and they will be healed. It used to happen all the time in this church. God would have me walk around minister, you know, teaching, and as I walked by people, they would get healed. We wouldn't even know about it. One guy was healed for, I think, five years. He was dying the day he walked in here. Five years later, his sister said, oh, by the way, <laughs> that day I brought my brother when he only had a few days to live. When you walked by him, he said something hit him, and he was, he's been healed of cancer, and, and he's doing whatever. Five years later, we got the report back, but he was healed that day. You know, and people will do that to you. Know they won't bother telling you right away the miracle happened. Oh wait! Oh, by the way, you know, it just crossed your mind. So you know, I'm telling you that you can have so much power in you that as you walk, people they will be healed. We used to, you know, I used to have a little prayer clause, and and I used to pray over them, and people would take and give them to their loved ones or whatever, and and put on their body, and they would be healed because of the power that's in that prayer cloth. This is what God wants us to carry. And the only way we can carry this kind of anointing is we're walking in holiness and righteousness. Come on. I'm going to tell you, I went through five years of pure hell where the devil was trying to cause me to lose my salvation. I fought tooth and nail day and night for five years. And I even cussed. I'm going to tell you the word I used, but I didn't use that bomb. And I was 60-some years old and hadn't cussed a word in my whole life. And from that day on, the devil was on me like you wouldn't believe. And I had to fight and cry out to God, lay on my face and cry, God, you know, don't let this happen. You know. And whatever I prayed in a fi five years, day and night, finally it ended. And I was back again. Still had the anointing. But the devil did everything he did trying to kill me and take me out of God's arms. Come on. God's in his Bible, uh, in his word since John the Baptist, you know, the war is raging. The battle's on. When John the Baptist came on the scene, the battle was on. Satan was out for us. I, you know, I can't even count how many people Satan got. They come through these doors. They said she teaches too hard. And we can't stand the hard teaching. In other words, she tells me I have to quit sinning and I don't want to quit sinning. Are you listening? The path is narrow. But everybody in here can find it. And you can walk in it. All right. I already did. Where am I at? But what I said was, do you want to be like Peter? Even his shadow healed the people as he walked by. People took Peter's handkerchiefs and laid them on people, and they were healed. This is what I'm doing in this dispensation of time. Great miracle healings will occur all across this great nation. A miracle will be great again because of the anointing destroying every yoke. The yoke breaker is here even this day, right here in this church, even this day. And he is moving amongst you with all the power heaven has to offer. If you can believe, receive your complete healing right now. Now, there's no reason, I'm just listening, there's no reason 
why any one of you should ever be in bondage. I read Matt, Matt, what's his name? Matt Sorger or whatever his name is. He had an article out. He was saying that God has taken people's mantles and given them to somebody else. And what did God tell us not too long ago? I'm going to take your mantle and I'm going to give it to somebody else. See, Tiana, if you don't walk in holiness, God's going to take take your dancing mantle and give it to somebody else. I'm just using that as an example. If I don't, if I mess up, he's going to take my mantle. God told me one time, he said, if you don't get out of doubt and unbelief, I'm going to snuff out your candlestick. And, and my candlestick is the church. So where are you at? Do you want God to take your mantle? Your mantle is your calling on your life. Some of you are playing games with it, and they're very, this is a very bad game that you're playing because you're going to kill yourself. Russian roulette is what I see. God didn't tell me that. I couldn't think of Russian roulette. You're playing Russian roulette with your anointings. Who's going to end up with your anointing? Are you going to keep it? One time I, I was really messing up. And, you know, I just I just couldn't get over. Somebody really hurt me really, 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 really bad. And it wasn't that I didn't forgive them. I just couldn't forget it. You know, and the hurt kept coming and coming over and over again. And God said, all right, daughter. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your anointing because you can't minister to my people messed up. I mean, tell you, that got my attention. I cried out to God, please don't take my anointing. It's the only thing I have. My anointing is Jesus in me. The Holy Spirit's a Godhead. I cried and I begged. But I got I got out of that mess too. <laughs> so God might have to come and scare you a little bit. But if he's already done that, I hope he scared you enough to understand it. He's right now, he's not, he wasn't playing then and he's not playing now. So if you know that you know that you know that you're not really walking right with God, you're just putting on a face. You know, I told the people in my house, if you, I'm, I'm bringing God back into my house. If you're going to live in my house and you're going to go to church and you're going to go to the Lighthouse Church. <laughs> you're not going to go to some other church and, just, you know, that, that uh, I know the churches you're thinking about going to and they really aren't doing what they should be doing. And so you have to come here. And and I'm 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 believing because God told me to do that, and I'm believing that as they more or less have to come to church. See, nobody should have to come to church. You should go to church because you love the Father, and you want to be to spend time with Him. But at the same time, you want to get your life cleaned up too, so that you can be a testimony for the street people that God's bringing in here. As I look around, a lot of you know what's, what it is to be. A, maybe you weren't out on the street, but you know what it is to be messed up. Some of you lived at home messed up. But some of you, you know, were out on the street messed up. You've run, you've run the whole garment. But why are you still serving the devil? I'm hearing God say, today is release day. And if you know that you're just in church just, just for some ungodly known reason, God wants to release you from that so that you can truly walk in his footsteps and find that narrow path and walk on it. You want to keep the mantle that God has promised you that you're going to have. All right. And I'm really not concerned if you go or stay. Because God's promised me nobody's going to steal your ministry. In other words, what God has told me he's going to do with me, he's still going to do with me. No matter what anybody else does. So, see, you aren't going to touch my ministry because I've walked, I'm have walked. i walking out my ministry. I'm fighting the devil day in and day out. What are you doing? What are you really doing? to save your salvation. And where are you really at? The altar's open if you want God to give you that touch. But I want to forewarn you that your days are numbered. I don't mean by death. I mean by your walk with God. And you don't have much time to get yourself right and stay right. God has 
when he put his son on that cross. The beatings is what gets to me. You know what that would be like. I know, you know, if you're as old as I am, you, we used to get beat with leather belts till blood ran down our bodies. And I know what that was like because I got a beating every day. But look what he did, the whip, the glass, everything. What he what he endured just so you and I could go to heaven. And we're spitting in his face when we don't serve him with all of our heart. The altar's open. And now if you don't want to come up, that's fine. That's your walk with God. But God's given you a chance this morning for him to touch you, to release you from that bondage.